Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. We have a, a full day ahead of us. This is just the beginning of it all. In just a few hours, we're going to fill the parking lot and the front lawn, and we're going to invite all of our neighbors to come and to trick-or-treat uh, this, this afternoon. And, and we started off the season planning this, and, and somebody said, we have trunk or treat. And I said, you can't call it trunk or treat because if you call it trunk or treat, when we run out of treats, that means we have to give them a trunk. Um, so instead, it's trunk o treat uh, this year, and we're going we're gonna to get together. We're going to welcome a bunch of people on campus. Hopefully, you have signed up. You are volunteering. You are planning to come to bring your kids, to bring your neighbor's kids, to collect as much candy and as much fun as you possibly can this afternoon. And if you haven't done that already, uh, show up. Come and be a part, bring your neighbors along, call your friends, see what they're doing this afternoon, and come and be a part of this. The weather has cleared up. It is a beautiful, beautiful day outside after being waterlogged for a couple of days. Uh, so you don't want to miss it today. I'm very much looking forward to it myself. Now, today is a day of response. So the message is a little bit shorter. It is a day that we come for Holy Communion, but a day that we also respond to God's word, the word that we've been hearing over the last few weeks and, and how God has been leading us to that next chapter, that next phase of faith and of life. Uh, so in the mail this week, if you're a member, a regular attender in the mail, you should have gotten a, a lovely letter from our stewardship team that came with a card that looks like this, a stewardship card, a pledge card. Uh, you've, you've probably, if you've been a part of, of this church or any church for your life, uh, you've seen something like this before. As we prepare to respond today at the end of the service, I want you to hear me say something about these pledges. Your finance committee and your steering team and your administrative teams here in the church are not going to use your pledges. This is not an administrative thing. This is a response to God, a way that we can tangibly come to God's altar and lay at the throne of God our pledge, our promise for how we will be a part of what God is doing in our lives, in our world, and through our church. So this is a chance for you to respond. Now, if you're visiting with us today and you didn't get one of these, we don't want you to feel any pressure. We have extra pledge cards. We would love for you to participate in this, but we don't want you to feel the pressure to have to do this. Uh, instead, we would invite you to pray and to listen to how God is, is leading you and in your next steps in life. We've talked about how uh, crucial our finances are to our faith and the role that they play. Um, and, uh, and I think sometimes we underestimate the role that they play. Sometimes we're good at, at, at giving God our time, our attention, our energy. We're good at, at showing up to worship and we're offering our voices and, and we offer all these sorts of things. But for most of us, and for myself included, our finances tend to be that last part, that last piece that we hold on to, that we cling to and we, we struggle the most to trust God with. But when we learn to trust God with this part of our life, we find that the blessings just flow. They, they overflow. And, and God's word even says that in Malachi chapter 3. I've read this a couple of times. In Malachi chapter 3, God says, test me in this. Bring your offerings, bring your tithes into the storehouse and see if I won't pour out so much blessing. See if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you can't contain it. And it's amazing when we see those words play out in the world around us and when we see those words play out in our own lives. So today we're, we're coming to that point, that jumping off point, if you will, that point of response and next steps for us. So as we talk about this response, we also look to see how the early church responded with generosity and with sharing. In Acts chapter 4... The Apostle Luke writes these words. He says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. This is the early church. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, 
and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a, the picture of the earliest Christians, that first generation after the resurrection of Christ, when, when Paul and Peter and, and the other apostles began to lead the community of faith. We know from the story of Pentecost that, that Peter and the others preached the good news of Jesus' resurrection, that Jesus, the Messiah, had come, he had lived for them, he had died for them, and he had risen for them. And thousands of people over the course of the next few days, came to believe, were baptized, and the church sprung up out of nothing. So you have this community of faith, and, and what do they do? They, they live their faith together. And this is very intimate. And, and what we have to realize about the, uh, the fourth chapter of Acts is the early church had a lot of pressure on their backs, a lot of weight on their shoulders, uh, just to continue living and continue surviving. Because this whole Jesus thing, this whole Christian thing was new. And the Jews were opposed to it. The Roman rulers were opposed to it. Anyone who was even worshiping pagan gods were opposed to it. That meant that if you heard the good news of Jesus Christ and you found it to be life-changing and decided to follow Jesus, you were going to face some challenges. You might lose your business. You might lose your livelihood. You might lose your well-being. You might lose even your family or your home. Imagine what it was like for a, a teenager in a Jewish household to decide that they were going to follow Jesus and to have parents that were opposed to that and were willing to put their foot down and say, it's either this Jesus fellow or it's me. And again and again, Christians chose Jesus. Now, we saw some good fruit come out of that. We saw other families say, you know, this, this faith thing, this Jesus thing, this Christian thing, this is real, and families would come around on the issue. But for a lot of people, that meant living in poverty. It meant living in need. And for those Christians who had means, they would sell what they had, they would give it away, they would, they would contribute to those who had need. But even more than that, Luke tells us that the early church was very communal, that people were moving in together, that they were breaking bread together, not once a week, not even once a day, but, but three times a day. Well, yours was mine, and, and this is a radical life. And I'm not, I want you to hear me too. I'm, I'm not suggesting this morning that we all move in together. I don't think any of us would vote in favor of all moving in together. But watching the early church share and watching how they hold things in common and, and love each other in such tangible ways, we can learn from that. And it wasn't just the early Christians in Jerusalem. It wasn't just right here in this in this part of the world, but it was, it was across the world, even in the most powerful parts of the world. Paul writes to the church in Rome in chapter 12 and gives them these instructions. He says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. This too is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's something to this sharing. And sharing is, is the response that we're going for today, being able to share the blessings that God has given us. Now, in the, in the commercial world, people have figured out, in the marketing world, people have figured out that sharing can actually heighten our experience of that which we enjoy. It can enhance our experience. If you go to the, if you go to the corner store today and, and you look on the, they, they have all these things that you can impulse buy right there at the counter. And, and chances are you'll see a little pack of gum that looks like this. It's a green stick of gum. Y'all recognize this? 
Maybe you've seen the commercials for Double Mint Gum. It's been around since 1914. Wrigley's has been making it. And since 1914, the slogan for Double Mint Gum hasn't changed. Double your pleasure, double your fun. I'm glad y'all don't live under a rock. So for 105 years, this gum's been around. And it comes not as a one-pack, but as a five-pack. And there's good reason for that. The commercials show us that we can enhance our fun, but one of the themes that you'll notice in the commercial that I'm about to show you is that nobody chews this gum alone. Let's play the commercial for us. catchy, right? And it encourages us to share so that if you buy a five pack of gum for, it's 35 cents now, this commercial was in 1998 when it was 25 cents, that inflation, it gets us every time. But, but this five pack of gum is designed so that you'll share it, so that you'll offer it to someone else. And if you notice a lot of other things, if you go trunk or treating this afternoon, you'll notice that a lot of the other things that you receive come so that you can share them. How does Twix come in a package? Left Twix and right Twix. And we share our Twix, right? How does Kit Kat come? And what's the tune for Kit Kat candy bars? Break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar, right? Your Hershey's chocolate that has been around longer than all of these. How does it come? Not as a solid cook, not as a solid candy bar, but with these nice little convenient grooves so that when you open it and the person sitting next to you smells that wonderful milk chocolate, they say, can I have some of that? And you break off a piece at the top and you hand it to them. These kind of things are meant to be shared. My absolute favorite in the world is Reese's peanut butter cups. And you'll notice that... Uh, most of them that you get for Halloween come one to a pack, but when you buy them in the store, have you noticed that they come in pairs? Now, I might argue that that's the one candy that you don't share because that's actually just two bites of candy right there. But so much of this is geared for us sharing. And what marketers have figured out and what social scientists have figured out is that when we share, we actually improve our own experiences. There was a, a researcher at Yale University, uh, Erica Boothby, that wanted to study this and wanted to test this and come up with some definitive evidence that this is the case. So Dr. Boothby created a test. It was a blind study. The participants didn't know what they were doing, but they were instructed to come in and to taste chocolate. And as they tasted these varying kinds of chocolate, they were to rate those chocolates on enjoyment. How enjoyable, how tasteful, how, how pleasurable were these chocolates? They had good chocolates and they had bad chocolates and, and things that were pre-tested to be good tasting. Well, as these participants participated in the test, they were put in a room with another participant. And that other participant, in some cases, was evaluating something else. That, that other participant might be looking at, at artwork, for instance, and rating the, the colors and, and the skill and the, the beauty of that artwork, while participant A, the one actually being studied, was still tasting chocolate. And participant A would, would taste the chocolate and would rate the chocolate, but then in other cases the second participant would also be trying the same chocolate at the same time. I, I'm, I'm thinking I should have set this up so we could actually experience this this morning, right? When both participants were tasting chocolate and rating chocolate at the same time, without exception, they always rated the chocolate higher. It's hard to explain, but there is something in our sharing that doesn't just bless the person that we're sharing with, but it blesses us 
as well. As Christians, we don't necessarily need a study that tells us that this is the effect of sharing. The early church shows us what the effect is of sharing that which is good. The early church demonstrates for us that when we share with each other, we have a hope that endures because we hope with others. We lean on each other. When we share with each other, the joy that we experience in Christ is exceedingly greater. This is why God puts us together as the church, why faith is never done in isolation. You cannot sit at home by yourself and be the church. You can sit at home and read scripture by yourself, and you can sing to yourself, but we find the joy that and the hope and the peace and the love and all those other good things that God intends for us in community. That's why we come together as the church. And we share our time and we share our resources and we break, be break bread together. When we share, we find that our experiences are amplified. And we share for other reasons as well. We share because... In our sharing, good things happen. The gospel is heard around the world. There is a child, because of, of what we contribute, what we participate in, there is a child somewhere in the world that we may meet, we may not meet. It may be a kid that's, that's right next door at Big Shanty Elementary School, or it might be a child in Afghanistan that will be touched by the word of God and their life changed for good. We give in these ways because it's a, a duty, it's a responsibility, it's what God has called us to do. But we shouldn't forget that when God calls us to give, to share, and to be, to be generous, it comes with strings attached, good strings. God says, test me in this and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven. Be generous and see if if I won't be even more generous. Last week, it was, it was Paul's instruction to the church where he said, if you will be generous, God will be even exceedingly generous so that you can give even more. We discover in our sharing that we are blessed as well. And that changes our response this morning, doesn't it? We don't bring a pledge card to the altar because it's a duty, because it's an administrative thing, but we do this because we are saying to God, God, I am going to participate in the things that you are doing in the world. I'm going to be a part of what you're doing through the church. I'm going to share with my brothers and sisters so that their joy might be exceeding, and together we can make a difference. But I also give because I know that in my giving, greater blessings await. This is one of the great promises of God that we forget sometimes to tell. That when we step in faith, when we trust God a little bit more, God never lets us down. So today we respond. In Paul's letter to Timothy, Timothy was Paul's protege. In in Paul's first letter to Timothy, in the last chapter, in, in the last words of this letter, he says this to, to young Timothy. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. Let us take hold of life that is truly life. When you respond by coming forward for communion today, we invite you to bring that pledge card with you and to lay it on the altar table to place it here in God's presence, not to turn it into a committee or to a pastor or to an institution, but to offer this as your pledge to God. And then when we, when we leave today, on your way out, we're going to have a basket, and we're going to invite you to take. We invite you to leave, and then we invite you 
to take. We're going to have a basket full of double mint gum. So that this week, today even, you can be a blessing to somebody else intentionally. I, I challenged the early church folks. I said, there's five sticks of gum in here. And you could choose to chew all five, all five sticks. But what I'd encourage you to do is at least give away two. Give away three or four. One person came up to me and said, I've had all this dental work. I can't chew gum. I said, well, lucky you. You get to give away all five sticks to five different people and bless five people today. We invite you to respond with action. We invite you to live generously, even with little blessings like a stick of gum for that person that you see today. We invite you to, to live as Christ lived for you. Let us pray. God, today we respond. Today we come to your altar and we receive blessings through Holy Communion. We leave our response here at the altar and we pray that whatever we promise today would be a blessing to you. It would bring you honor and glory. And we pray that in our worship and our praise and our offering that we would be overwhelmed with your blessing as well. God, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers as we seek to live as Christ lives for us. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Now before we celebrate communion...